Thank you everybody for being here and welcome. I have a uh, PowerPoint presentation I wanna share with you about the new Pew survey that just came out this past week. And then we will leave plenty of time for Q and A. So if you think of a question while I'm speaking or have a question about one of the slides that you see, please um, write it into the chat or write it down on a piece of paper and we'll get to it uh, when I'm done with the, the frontal presentation. The, um, the over under on this presentation is 37 and a half minutes if anyone out there is a gambler uh, starting from now. But let's see if I can easily share my screen. All right, can folks see the PowerPoint? Yep. Great. So there's a new survey of American Jewry, and it's kind of a big deal because it only happens once every decade or so. And it has a big influence on the way the Jewish community programs and tries to serve the interests and needs of the people they imagine themselves serving. So this is an opportunity for us, many of us, on this call are leaders in our communities and activists to step back, take a look at some of the numbers and get a sense of how things are for the Jewish community. Now, sociology is not an exact science and the Pew authors of this report are really amazingly uh, professional and I am really appreciative that this is being done by an organization like Pew but they're human, the questions they administer and the methodology they use are, um, there's no exact science to it, they're all based on choices that they've made. And these authors of the report, certainly as far as the findings go, are using a spin. They have their own perspective on things. So I'm gonna talk about that in a bit, but I have my own spin. So I'm just gonna be upfront about it, that the things I'm interested in and the way I understand the numbers um, may be different than the way you do or the way other people do in the organized Jewish community. Before I dive into those numbers though, I wanna say a word about pluralism because this is the first time that we've done a program that is both the uh, Society for Humanistic Judaism, which by the way, hi, my name is Paul Golan. I'm executive director of the Society for Humanistic Judaism. And I'm also the lead staff of our pluralistic initiative, Jews for a Secular Democracy. So some of you may have come in because you are volunteering with Jews for a Secular Democracy. Others of you may be uh, leaders and volunteers of Society for Humanistic Judaism. Jews for a Secular Democracy, Democracy is pluralistic in that the goal is to bring the many different ways that Jews identify and believe to issues of church state separation through a Jewish lens. The goal is to bring all of it to demonstrate that you can't pick one over the other. We have all these different approaches just within our own religion, let alone all the religions or no religion uh, that encompass American society. The Society for Humanistic Judaism is not pluralistic, but we are a voice for secular and humanistic Jews within pluralistic settings in the Jewish community. And I've been a Jewish communal professional for a couple of decades now. I've been in many so-called pluralistic settings that felt to me as a secular and humanistic Jew to not be inclusive of me. And as we look at the numbers tonight, we'll see that uh, secular Jews are a pretty significant percent of the Jewish population. So even if you come into this tonight from the perspective of a um, person who has faith or religion, understand that when we talk about secularity tonight, it's so we all get a better sense of who's actually out there in the organized Jewish community. So I've split this conversation uh, between Jewish beliefs and Jewish politics, but you'll see that there's overlap as we go through this uh, between the two. And this first part will be a little bit longer than, than the politics part. To me, the big finding, the big number that really jumped out at me, Pew asked a question that had not been asked before, which was, do you believe in the God of the Bible? They used that phraseology for the first time, as far as I know, 
in a Jewish demographic study. And I'm thrilled by that because since I came on to SHJ uh, almost five years ago, I've been telling audiences when I present that most Jews don't believe in the God of the Bible. And now I've got a number I can attach to it, which is that only 26% of all American Jews believe in the God of the Bible. This won't be the big number that people talk about from the Pew survey, but I don't know why not. Because to me, this changes everything in terms of the questioning that we can do for why we as a Jewish community, why we as Jews do anything, right? If most of us don't believe it has, it's mandated by a God that gives commandments, then doesn't that open it all up for questioning and conversation? So I'm really excited about that. What you see here is, um, and I'm, I'm gonna share many charts that they published in the Pew Report, but I encourage you all to go download the report and read it. It's pretty fascinating stuff, and I'm only gonna be giving a sampling of, of what's in there. This left column is percentages of Jewish adults who feel that certain way. The right column compares it to all US adults. So the first item is that religion is very important to them. Only 21% of all Jewish adults in America agree that religion is very important to them compared to 41% of all US adults. That's a big difference. Uh, there's big differences throughout this whole thing. So believing in the God of the Bible, only 26% compared to 56% of our uh, fellow Americans. Now, this doesn't mean that everybody who doesn't believe in the God of the Bible identifies as atheist or agnostic, quite the contrary. You can see the second from bottom line is 50% of all Jewish adults believe in some other higher power or spiritual force. Pew didn't drill down on what that means. I think that's a, a very interesting study to happen that hasn't happened. Um, but that combined with the 26% who believe in the, the God of the Bible, of course, suggests that the majority of Jews believe in something. But 22% of American Jewish adults said they do not believe in any higher power or spiritual force. And that compares to only 10% of US adults who are atheists. And so that's more than double among American Jews who, who are atheists. And these translate to some pretty big numbers, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this makes sense if you understand that the majority of all Jews say being Jewish is mainly about culture and ancestry and not about religion. So what Pew did was ask, um, is being Jewish mainly about, and then it was a multiple choice. And I box, I put a box around the folks who said, it's mainly about ancestry, or it's mainly about culture, or it's mainly about ancestry and culture, right? They asked, uh, um, they asked about religion as well. So of the folks who did not include religion, in their answer of mainly about, we're already up to 53%. And then there's an, another 9% who say other, whatever that other might be. But considering they had religion as a choice and they didn't pick it, um, you know, this could go up to 62% who say being Jewish is mainly about culture and ancestry and not about religion. Pew does something that is controversial to some people with their methodology, which is that they divide the Jews between Jews by religion and Jews of no religion. And what they're actually doing is being inclusive by doing this. They're providing for the diversity of Jewish identity. And they didn't invent this methodology. They did this in their 2013 study of American Jews. And that was based on the methodology that the Jewish community had devised in studies, I believe dating back to, to 1970, but certainly the 1990 National Jewish Population Study, the 2001 National Jewish Population Study did some version of this because, you, you know, as the previous slide just pointed out, you can't just measure Jews who identify as Jewish by religion. So how do they get to this? They ask a multiple choice screener question, what is your present religion, if any? And if you, you've got a list like Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, 
none in particular. If you check the Jewish box, you're Jewish by religion, and that's it, you're in. If you check anything else, there's a follow-up question, aside from religion, do you consider yourself Jewish in any way, ethnically, culturally, family background? If in that first question, you had said either atheist, agnostic, or none in particular, but on this question, you said, yes, I do identify, I do consider myself Jewish in some other way. If you have a Jewish parent, or if you were raised Jewish, then Pew calls you a Jew of no religion. And these two groups combined is how Pew determines the overall Jewish population. But it is not the totality of everyone they measured because there were folks who say yes to identifying Jewish in some other way. They didn't check Jewish by religion, but they did say yes, but they do not have a Jewish parent or a Jewish upbringing. And Pew puts them in this group called um, Jewish Affinity, and they do not count them toward the overall Jewish population. Some people may want to. Pew is very open to say, go ahead if you want to, um, but they choose not to. And it makes sense with this next group, which are people who checked Christian or Muslim or Buddhist in that first question. And then when asked, do you consider yourself Jewish in any way? say, yes, I do, but they don't have a Jewish parent or a Jewish upbringing. So for example, somebody who is Christian and says, oh, well, Jesus was Jewish and therefore I feel Jewish too. Um, that's Jewish affinity and Pew did not count that person as a Jew. If you say, if you didn't check Jewish for your religion and you say no to aside from religion, do you consider yourself Jewish? but you do have a Jewish parent or you were raised Jewish, Pew has a new category, a, a different category for you, and that is Jewish background. And here's how it plays out in the numbers. So first of all, for me, obviously the headline is there are 1.5 million adults who are Jews of no religion. Um, this shows two columns. One is the share of US adults. Um, Jews make up 2.4% of the US adult population. And the column on the right is the estimated total number. So net Jews, so Jews by religion plus Jews of no religion, according to Pew, adds up to 5,800,000 roughly. But you can see that these other categories, Jewish background and Jewish affinity, are not insignificant. 2.8 million people of Jewish background, meaning a Jewish parent or upbringing, but don't consider themselves Jewish. Um, at all, not even culturally, or 1.4 million Jews, uh, Jewish affinity people. Um, many of them, um, a million of them are another religion, but still consider themselves Jewish in some way. So some pretty remarkably large numbers here, I think, uh, for these other categories that are not included in the overall population. And of course, the big thesis for Pew which is related to their work on studying all religions in America, is that the nuns are on the rise, not the NUN Catholic clergy nuns, the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, people of no religion, which Pew has been tracking over the past couple of decades, and I hope you, you've heard of this, and the number of people who don't affiliate with an organized religion is increasing. Jews of no religion, according to Pew, says, that um, is now at 27% of all Jews. When they did this study in 2013, it was at 22%. There's all kinds of warnings in this report that you can't directly compare the two studies because they used a different methodology. But on this number, it seems like they're okay um, comparing it. 22% uh, Jews of no religion in 2013, now up to 27% Jews of no religion among Jewish adults. And this bottom graph, shows how among younger age cohorts, age 18 to 29, Jews of no religion makes up 40%, which is huge. It's a very big percentage. On the other end of the spectrum, Orthodox are still only about 10%. Um, and that's less than half the, to you know, the number of Jews of no religion. Why do I bring this up? Because for decades, literally decades, every time a study comes out, 
folks look at the numbers and say it's only a matter of time before the Orthodox are the largest denomination in America. And not only hasn't it happened, it hasn't even, it hasn't even started yet. In the 1990 National Jewish Population Study, they found 8% of American Jews were Orthodox, identified as Orthodox. And that number has never gone over 10%. And Pew found it 9%, this first column at the top. Total um, percentage of Jews who identify as Orthodox is 9%. We'll, we'll look a little bit later about why each time it seems like they're about to become ascendant, but it hasn't happened yet. Doesn't mean it, it's not gonna happen, hasn't happened yet though. Uh, you can also see the percentages of the other denominations, 17%, conservative, 37% reform. No particular branch is the second largest at 32%. Um, and then other branch at 4%. And this is the first, but you'll see this over and over again. They break down the totals by Jews by religion and Jews of no religion. So for those of you involved with humanistic Judaism, we fall somewhere in that other branch, but so does Reconstructionist Judaism, and so does renewal, and I don't know what else people out there might consider another branch, but we're small, and, uh, you know, reconstructing Judaism is much larger than us, and so maybe there are three out of the four percent, and we're, we're a percentage point. Um, at some point, Pew will release the data set, and we might be able to see, um, actually, whether we're named, but it won't be more than one, one and a half percent, or maybe two percent. Uh, but that's identity with, that's not membership, by the way. So the story that Pew is telling is that both poles are rising. On one end are the secular uh, Jews of no religion, and on the other end is the Orthodox. And the reason why they're saying this, even though it's been said after every Jewish communal study, for as long as I've been in, in the Jewish community, um, is because of this age breakdown. When you look at the youngest age cohort, it's 17% Orthodox. And we know they have many, many more children than non-Orthodox Jewish households. Um, and then at the other end, you see no particular branch among the youngest age cohort is up to 41%. And then the middle is falling out. The conservative and reform movements are much smaller when you look at um, the age cohort. But um, what, what and, and if I was conservative, I'd be really freaked out by being in single digits among that youngest age cohort. But what is not shown in this snapshot is the tradition of out migration from from the more religious denominations to the less religious denominations. So that's what this graph is showing. And the way to read this is um, that top sentence, among US adults who were raised Jewish by religion within, let's put in Orthodox Judaism, you go to the first column, the percent who today are still Jewish, 94%, right? But the percent who are still Orthodox is only 67%. So they've lost, um, you know, over 30% of the people who are born Jewish, but this out-migration mi out is even worse in conservative Judaism, where even though 93% of Jews who are raised conservative are still Jewish, only 41% of them are still conservative Jews. And you can see 30% are now reform, 15% are no particular branch, 7% 7 7 are not Jewish at all. And the movement is in almost all in one direction, which is out of religion. Uh, you can see on the second line in conservative Judaism, only 2% of adults raised conservative are now Orthodox. In Reform Judaism, only 1% of Jews who were raised Reform are now Orthodox and so on. So the movement is out of religious Judaism. Uh, to the point where those who are raised with no particular branch, 21% of them don't even consider themselves Jewish at all. Hey, Paul, really quickly, someone asked if you can use a pointer when you're mentioning a stat so that folks know which one you're um, referencing. I think there is, uh, yeah, I do see your mouse moving. So maybe- Oh, you do? Yes, I do see your mouse moving. So if you could use that Good. so folks can see, go ahead. That was gonna be my next question. How do I use a pointer? Okay, so the, the gripe I have is that the narrative of the Pew Report 
And frankly, I think it's reflective of the narrative of the organized Jewish community in large part is that Jews of no religion are less than. So what we have here is a large chart that I cut in half. So I will use the pointer, but basically they ask a lot of questions about Jewish practice and activities, and which is good. And they added more questions this time than in 2013, which is also good. But so above this um, gray bar, they're asking about ritual practices, holiday celebrations, and so on. And they give the left column all US Jews and then they, again, they break it down by Jews by religion, Jews of no religion. And on all these indicators, Jews of no religion appear less than, right? So Jews of no, 20% of Jews of no religion fast on Yom Kippur, um, which is surprisingly large to me. But when you compare it to the 56% of Jews by religion who do fast on part or all of Yom Kippur, um, it's less than, right? And significantly less than. And then that becomes the narrative. Um, I, you know, I don't know what part of Yom Kippur means. I always fast for part of Yom Kippur, you know, until I have breakfast. So I, I don't know how exactly how, I guess it's self-selecting how people measure that. Um, but some of these other indicators or activities are really interesting as far as um, uh, Jews who say they often or sometimes cook or eat traditional Jewish foods. I mean, that's the majority of Jews of no religion. That might be something interesting to celebrate. But then you look at the overwhelming majority of Jews by religion who do that, and the narrative still becomes less than. One of these uh, questions was that you engage in political, this is where the blue arrow is, you engage in political activism as an expression of Jewishness. So not just that you engage in political activism, but that you do it as an expression of Jewishness. And that one third of Jews do it might be very promising for those of us who are trying to organize around Jews for secular democracy. Um, but this Jews of no religion number uh, is half um, less than, and that may feel discouraging. So I won't give you all of the graphs from the Pew report, but this happens over and over and over again. Jews of no religion are less Jewishly educated. They are less synagogue affiliated. They are less emotionally attached to Israel. They uh, put less emphasis on being Jewish or belonging to the Jewish people. They care less about having Jewish grandkids and they have less close Jewish friends. These are all things that the Pew survey measured and they break it down, but their findings between Jews by religion and Jews of no religion. And they show that Jews of, of no religion are less than over and over again. And the good news is as somebody who spent a long time as an advocate for inclusion of intermarried families, the dichotomy used to be between the unmarried and the intermarried. So we're not beating up the intermarried throughout this whole report, which maybe that's good news, but now we're beating up uh, the Jews of no religion of which I am also one of. So, you know, I still have the same feelings about, about why and, and what's happening here. What Pew doesn't measure is where Jews of no religion are more than Jews by religion. And this is uh, a theory I've had for, for quite some time. I've put out there, I believe uh, an op-ed I wrote is gonna run later this week that touches on this, which I'm excited about. But basically your identity is on kind of a set of sliders between different poles and I don't know if you guys, most of you are old enough to remember those hi-fi stereos where you got to mess around with the fade and the um, balance and so on. And I, I miss the, the tactile feel of those kind of things now that we're in the digital world. But I use it as a metaphor kind of for the way we slide between religious and secular, right? We're all, all Jews are somewhere on this kind of spectrum. Uh, and also, We'll talk later about where Jews are on this on the spectrum between conservative and liberal. And I'm putting them on, on those sides on purpose because there is a, a connection between being religious and being conservative statistically. But what's really happening here that doesn't get discussed is the difference between being particularistic about Judaism and being universal. And that's the, the narrative that doesn't come out from the Pew survey and is never really presented by the organized Jewish community because the organized Jewish community is particularistic. Now we have been dealing with this tension forever because you know this is a, the famous quote from Rabbi Hillel 
if I am not for myself, who will be for me, right? That's the particularistic side of things. If I am not for others, what am I? And if not now, when? That is the uh, universalist side. And we're constantly in, ten in tension. And I'm not placing one as morally superior to the other. I'm acknowledging though, that there is this tension here, right? You have to look after your own family first. And, and before you start helping other people, you have to make sure that you have security and so on. So I get it. I'm just saying that there is a tension, a balance between these and Pew doesn't get at it. And if they did, we'd see things about Jews of no religion where they would be more than. And we see some of it, we have to glean it from the numbers. So on diversity, the Pew survey found Jews of no religion are more than twice as likely to be part of a multiracial home. They are twice as likely to be lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, or queer. Or on the notion that all people are equal. I feel like Jews who intermarry are living the value of seeing all people as equal. They're, they're not going to limit who they fall in love with based on uh, criteria of of uh, commonality or ethnicity. And Jews of no religion are overwhelmingly intermarried. 80% of married Jews of no religion are intermarried and 60% of Jews of no religion are children of intermarriage. So there's just this incredible overlap among that. And in a lot of ways, uh, Pew showing the difference between Jews of no religion and Jews by religion is in a lot of ways still this tension between in marriage and intermarriage that has embroiled the Jewish community for so long. This survey found that nearly 70% of the intermarried raised children with some Jewish identity. But again, when you look at these bottom two bars here, um, if this, these are the in married, you know, Jews married to Jews, 93% raise their kids Jewish by religion as Pew defines it. And for the bottom bar, Jews, who marry non-Jewish spouses, only 28% raise them Jewish by religion, but 29% raise them Jewish, but not by religion. 12% raise them partly Jewish by religion. If it adds up to over 50%, it means more Jews are being created because of the intermarriage math that I won't get into. But there's still this sense of less than when the organized Jewish community sees that. I see this and I think incredible opportunity, certainly for humanistic Judaism to go and try to reach those folks. But the whole Jewish community, I feel, should see this as, as a win. You know, it's meaningful enough to incorporate in some ways by intermarried households, but it's generally not seen that way. So the challenge for our movement as secular humanistic Jews, some of them are finding these folks, finding and reaching either the atheists or Jews of no religion and articulating to them, why do it at all? These are folks who don't participate in ritual or life cycle events or holiday celebrations for the most part. And it's because they don't see a benefit in doing it. And that's part of the message. And the other might be being a little bit more bold about what we do and don't believe, you know, being upfront about a Jewish universalist approach, however that might look, uh, celebrating intermarriage. Um, and thinking about it, you know, if it's not the God of the Bible, even if you believe in some universal spirit, if that universal spirit is not setting down a code of law and behavior, how are you, how are you deriving your ethics? It's from humanism. So getting more people to understand what humanism is, is the opportunity. This drills down a little bit more into that um, uh, percentage of who believes, you know, this is 22% don't believe in anything. So when you do the, the math on that, it means there are 1,276,000 Jewish atheists, adults in America. Um, here's even among Jews of no religion, half believe in some other higher power spiritual force, about the same numbers as Jews by religion, this middle piece. But obviously believe in the God of the Bible, only 7% Jews of no religion compared to 33% Jews by religion. But even Jews by religion, two thirds don't believe in the God of the Bible. It's, it's really remarkable to me. 
Um, but what's interesting to note is that so 14% of Jews by religion don't believe in any, you know, they're atheists and 44% Jews of no religion. So it would seem like there's many more atheists among Jews of no religion. But because there's so many more Jews by religion, it's actually not that far off. You've got nearly 600,000 Jews by religion who are atheists and nearly 700,000 Jews of no religion who are atheists. So one option for humanistic Judaism is to just say, look, Jews by religion are engaging already in Jewish communal life. And there's almost 600,000 of them that are atheists. And we can narrow our focus and just try to appeal to more of those folks. So it was interesting to kind of uh, run the numbers. The other chart that I find really fascinating that Pew did ask about the last time around in 2013 that they did again this time was what do you feel is essential to being Jewish? And the highest scoring again this time, as last time, was remembering the Holocaust. And that was true for Jews by religion and Jews of no religion. But also scoring very high with this blue arrow is working for justice and equality in society. And that's great. And again, you know, Jews of no religion seems less than, but this is still a very high number. Almost half of all Jews of no religion um, see that as essential to being Jewish. Um, one thing I want to point out is this uh, yellow arrow that overall, more most Jews don't think it is essential that um, to your Jewish identity to care about Israel. So while things are literally blowing up right now around Israel, and it feels like everybody is involved in this very emotional uh, argument, arguments that are happening right now. I also want to remind folks that there are a significant percentage of Jews, and especially Jews of no religion, um, who don't think, who just don't think it's essential. You know, these are American Jews, and caring about Israel is just not essential to their Jewish identity. Um, later on, we'll see that they think it's important, but there's a big difference between important and essential. And as with the last Pew survey, to me, this is the most damning number, and it didn't get any play in the organized Jewish community, but basically, most Jews don't think it's essential to be part of an organized Jewish community. And that is a challenge for us as an organized Jewish community at the Society for Humanistic Judaism. It's a challenge for everyone in the community, but especially among these Jews of no religion, when only 12% think it's essential to be part of a Jewish community. Um, that represents a real challenge for us. I'm gonna go quick on the politics piece because quite frankly, I think Pew really missed an opportunity in the questions that they did and didn't ask, but I'll share, I'll give a taste of what came out of it for me. And again, going back to my sliders, um, they found that because so many Jews are secular, and to me, that represents a, a more toward universalism than particular approach to life. So many Jews are liberal. So first, they talk about party affiliation. And as I'm sure most of you already know, most Jews are democratic or lean democratic. 71% of all Jews. And the Orthodox are the exact flip. And what was surprising to me about this chart is that when they break it down by denomination, even conservative Judaism has 70% democratic or lean democratic, which is the same as overall Jews. Um, it's literally, you know, those of you who may not know, it's a term of art to call the liberal Jewish denominations basically is, is a euphemism for non-Orthodox, is to say liberal Jewish denominations, but it's literally true as far as political affiliation goes, you know, there's not a huge difference between reform conservative and no particular branch. There's a big difference um, among the Orthodox in, in terms of party affiliation. Pew asked a lot of questions about anti-Semitism. I understand why this is a concern. Most Jews believe anti-Semitism is up compared to five years ago, 75% of American Jews believe that anti-Semitism is up and they're kind of split on why that is between um, because there are more anti-Semites or because people feel more comfortable expressing their anti-Semitism or both. But either way, um, they did a lot of measuring of have you experienced anti-Semitism? Have you seen anti-Semitism? Orthodox Jews have seen a lot more anti-Semitism anti 
the non-Orthodox Jews, in part because of um, the distinctive uh, clothes and identifying markers that they wear. Um, so, so this, I understand why Pew wanted to, to dive into this. They asked a lot about Trump, which to me is really disappointing. This survey was conducted between November 2019 and June 2020. But they should have known they wouldn't have the results till well after the presidential election. And I would have loved for them to ask questions about abortion or the Supreme Court or lots of other issues, uh, racial justice that, that Jews are involved in and that care, they care about, the environment. None of that got asked. And there was this real focus, almost an entire chapter on feelings about Trump, which I hope, um, I'm showing my bias now, but I hope it's irrelevant and will stay irrelevant. But um, it's certainly a lot less relevant now that he's not president, unfortunately, um, that it's not relevant anymore. On this chart, we're looking at uh, how Jews describe, how friendly Jews felt Trump was toward Israel and toward US Jews. So toward Israel, the majority of Jews felt Trump was friendly. That includes even Jews of no religion, half felt he was friendly toward Israel. Obviously, Republican leaning and Republican Jews felt overwhelmingly that he was friendly. They also felt he was friendly toward US Jews, but they're the only group that felt he was friendly toward US Jews. Most Jews and total number, total percentage of Jews, only 31% felt Trump was friendly toward US Jews for whatever that's worth now. They also ask a lot about Israel. And again, this is reflecting what the organized Jewish community cares deeply about, but not necessarily what the Jews on the ground care about. So I found this chart one of the more interesting ones because they asked what percentage of US Jews um, who say they have, they have something in common with Jews in Israel. They have a lot, they have some, not much, nothing at all. Those are these columns. And overall, only 19% of American Jews feel they have a, a lot in common with Jews in Israel, which is, I don't know, that, that seemed to surprise me. Obviously, it goes way down between Jews by religion, Jews of no religion. They also look at the denominations. I thought it was fascinating to see that only 12% of Reformed Jews uh, think they have a lot in common with Jews in Israel. Uh, it, to me, that may, may, that may say something about the tension around denominationalism within Israel. Uh, so it's just, it's just interesting to see. They did get in some of the separation between intermarried and inmarried. Um, here at the bottom, Jews who are intermarried, only 8% feel like they have a lot in common with Jews in Israel, and 31% of the inmarried feel they have a lot in common with Jews in Israel. You know, this is not necessarily surprising, but interesting to see percentages attached to it. Getting back to that question of what's essential, you know, so essential was the highest level. They said important but not essential. When you include that, um, caring about Israel, most Jews feel is either essential or important. But when you look at the age breakdown here by the orange arrow, it goes way down from those over 65 where 52% claim it's essential all the way down to 35% among Jews age 18 to 29. And so, you know, how does that bode for Jewish communal support for Israel, if that's something that you care deeply about? And at the bottom, you've got the big difference between Democrat and Republican. Again, if you add up um, important and essential, it's not that huge of a difference. But when you only look at who says essential, um, there is a growing divide, I think, between Republican and Democratic Jews around Israel. Here's one of the rare examples of where Jews of no religion are more than Jews by religion. They are more than optimistic about the potential for a two-state solution. 74% of Jews of no religion uh, still have uh, belief that a way can be found for Israel and an independent, independent Palestinian state to coexist peacefully compared to 59% of Jews by religion. But the Jews by religion ones are getting knocked way down because it includes almost all the Orthodox, among whom very few believe uh, in the prospects for a two-state solution. You can see the Orthodox with this yellow arrow, only 29% maintain hope for um, 
uh, coexistence between two states. And that is also reflected uh, among Republican Jews, of, you know, where there is just tremendous overlap between the Orthodox and, um, and Republicans. And finally, this goes back to that question about, do you believe in God of the Bible in a somewhat fascinating way? So they asked if you believe God gave the land that is now Israel to the Jewish people. And overall, 32% of Jews said yes. Now, remember in that first slide, only 26% of all Jews believe in the God of the Bible, but a lot more than 26% we're now up to 32% who believe that that God gave the land to Israel. So it's interesting that if, if you ask the same question uh, in different ways, you get uh, other folks to kind of um, acknowledge some kind of belief. But um, still, only a third of American Jews believe in the notion that God gave the land. Um, and obviously among Jews of no religion, it's dramatically lower, although it's interesting to see 11% of Jews of no religion think God gave that land um, to the Jewish people. And obviously at the very bottom, I highlighted that Democrats also um, don't particularly believe the land was given by God. That's a big difference between Republicans. But again, this is based on um, who is a Republican Jew. Mostly they are Orthodox, and 87% of the Orthodox believe God gave the land to um, Israel. It's interesting to see 46% of conservative Jews do as well. This chart is uh, uh, drilling down a little bit more on that question about do you engage in activism as an expression of Jewish identity? And I already pointed out Jews of no religion seem to score much lower. But um, conservative Jews score the highest, which was interesting also to look at, at the denominations, the denominational breakdown. It's something else to think about, and I think this is relevant to our Jews for a Secular Democracy Initiative. Um, Jews over the age, 65 and older, score the highest as far as seeing their activism as an expression of Jewish identity. There isn't a dramatic difference in the age breakdown, except for people, Jews age 30 to 49. I don't know why that is. Perhaps that's a time in their life where they're overwhelmed with too many other things. Um, and I also thought it was interesting that there was no real difference between Republicans and Democrats in terms of seeing their Jewish identity uh, informing their activism. But overall, Jews identify liberal. And I felt that this was a really interesting way at getting at the question because they asked about moderate. It wasn't just, do you see yourself as conservative or liberal? So they break the dichotomy that so much of our country is in right now and ask about moderate. And it seems to me that by doing so, they actually take more people away from conservative than from liberal. So overall, Jews, are claimed to be 50% self-identified liberal, 32% moderate, only 16% conservative. That goes up among Jews by religion, goes down among Jews of no religion. Um, but if you look at the younger cohort, you can see pretty much a steady increase in liberalism among that youngest cohort, even though Pew talks about the rise of the two poles, Orthodox and Jews of no religion, that doesn't seem to be reflected in, in this number here, about 60% of age 18 to 29 see themselves as liberal, 22% um, moderate and 17% conservative. Uh, they also include an education level, um, perhaps this has been documented elsewhere as well, those who have higher levels of education are less likely to be conservative. But again, because they include this moderate position, without knowing what the is what issues they're moderate on, um, folks with a college degree, about 59, 60% liberal, but 28% moderate, and then 11 or 12% uh, conservative. But even among Republicans, only 55% of them called themselves conservative. 41% said that they were moderate and 4% of Republicans called themselves liberal. Um, and you get much less moderates among Democrats who 
feel comfortable, it seems, calling themselves liberal. So that's what I drew out of the Pew study as far as Jewish beliefs and Jewish uh, politics, how they might relate. Obviously, this is just my spin on things and I'm welcome to have pushback. But as I said, there, there weren't a lot of the questions I would have hoped to see, but here's what I gleaned from some of the other answers. So they asked about, should rabbis officiate at gay weddings? 71% of US Jews said yes. And then another 15% or so said, um, depends on the circumstances. But overwhelmingly to me, that suggests support for gay marriage. And also 9% of the Jews surveyed said that they are gay, lesbian, or bisexual. They were not, they, they were not asked about uh, trans or queer. I believe obviously it would have gone up, I think significantly higher than 9% if they had. But either way, I, I think a case can be made that this suggests good support for LGBTQ equality. Three in 10 Jews have a postgraduate degree. Many Jews have a, a college degree. This suggests uh, support for advocacy around science-based policy making and um, environmental causes to me. But they didn't ask, so I have to read into it. And 85% of Orthodox Jews went to Jewish day school or yeshivas for at least one year. They, you know, until they release the data set, you can't really get at how many more than one year they went, but I presume most of them went their entire schooling. And they are huge supporters of voucher programs, which those of you who've been following our Jews for Secular Democracy initiative know that we find that very problematic because of the way that uh, religious fundamentalism abuses those voucher programs. So some stuff I read into the report, but not because they asked these direct questions. Hope that gives a sense of the way I looked at the report, but I encourage you all to dig into it on your own and interpret it however you want. But I am now gonna remove my spotlight and um, Sarah, maybe if, were you able to follow the chat because I wasn't able to look at any of the chat. Yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah, there were there were a few questions. I definitely would encourage folks to um, submit more questions in the chat. Um, one, just quick out of the way, uh, someone was asking if Hasidim were part of the survey and, and if so, where they were reflected. Great question. And this may answer why um, that rise of the Orthodox may finally start to happen. They didn't break it down in the report that I saw. At some point, the data will be out there and people will do additional reporting on it. But my understanding is that, so when they say Orthodox, they're including modern Orthodoxy and they're including what we call in, you know, ultra Orthodoxy. The ultra Orthodox don't call themselves ultra Orthodox, Hasidim um, and the various sects. And my understanding is that modern orthodoxy has actually really been in free fall over the past couple of decades, as far as numbers go. And Haredi and, and ultra orthodox has been on the rise. So that 10%, so I don't know what the breakdown is of that 10% or 9% that, that are orthodox, but there is just a general sense that um, the ultra orthodox are on the rise. And so maybe we finally will start seeing their percentages increase. Um, because modern orthodoxy, it seems, um, has not been able to maintain its numbers. If folks also want to, oh, you have another, Sarah? Oh, yeah. Um, do you mind if I just keep rolling? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. So this was sort of a comment turned into a question. Um, they said, if I was asked uh, about my religion, I would say Jewish, so I'd be counted as Jewish by religion. I imagine that's true for many non-religious Jews. So the Jews with no religion seems like it might be an undercount. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I, I hope that I tried to get across that Jews of no religion don't automatically mean atheist, agnostic, free thinker, humanist Jew. Um, and, you know, most of them believe in some um, higher power. So it is a misnomer, but it is a way for Pew and other survey takers to capture the Jews who don't say Jewish for their religion. And as I said, not to like push it too much, but I'm pretty excited about this op-ed if it sees the light of day, which I, you know, the editor said that it will. And I lead off by saying, 
I don't know how I would have answered if I had been asked, because I do obviously feel strongly Jewishly identified, but I also feel like atheist and humanist is actually a more marginalized identity in American society. And I may have felt like, let me represent that. Uh, so I would have been torn. But generally, when people ask, what's your religion? I know where they're going, and I'll just say Jewish. So I do think that a lot, and, and I showed the numbers, that there are plenty of atheist Jews by religion, um, almost as many as atheist Jews of no religion. So yeah, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't, I think most, certainly most of the members of the Society of Humanistic Judaism, I think would have shown up as Jews by religion. I see the question about who funded the study. Two places, one is the Pew Foundation, itself, and the other is a Jewish family foundation called, I hadn't heard of them before, the New Bauer Family Foundation. Um, and I haven't looked at their 990 yet to see what else they fund. But my guess is that they, they gave Pew a matching grant and said, if you cover half, we'll cover half. And these are really expensive studies to do. So that was a generous grant, but it is a Jewish communal family foundation. They are interested in learning from the Jewish communal perspective. Related to that, and I'm going to combine sort of two questions into one, um, are there corresponding surveys in other countries like Israel? Uh, what's the easiest way to consolidate those survey results around the globe? And does the Jewish community publish its own surveys? Do, do they do that? come out more than just once per decade? The Jewish community stopped doing their own because it was hugely expensive and controversial. Uh, so the Jewish community, the, the um, Federation umbrella, which is now called um, the North America, uh, oh my God, someone help me out. I'm gonna have to edit this out of the video. Um, Federations of North America, but it was called something else in the 90s when they did it. Um, they did the 1990 study, they did the 2001 study. When it became apparent after 2010 that they weren't gonna do another study, a group of people went to Pew and said, will you take this on? But if you look at the report and you see who advised Pew on that 2013 study and again on the 2020 study, it is, I think I'll use the word biased um, toward what the Jewish community wants to know and who wants to be um, tailoring the numbers to, to their worldview. And um, the bottom line is that when Pew did its first Jewish study in 2013, it wanted to be able to compare it to the studies in 1990 and 2000. So you can only modify the methodology so much before it becomes useless and you can't compare among them. So in a lot of ways, they're kind of locked into a methodology that was set by, I mean, when you look at who does demography of the Jews, it's the Jews. You know, that in 2013, I was very excited that the Pew Foundation, which is not the Jews, it's the Pews, is, is going to be able to take a more objective viewpoint. And then I was kind of disappointed to recognize, and I understand why they have to do this from a, a sociological point of view, they needed to still use a lot of that same methodology of how do we break down the Jews? How do we show who's more than and who's less than and, and so on? So here's a question that isn't directly related to the survey, but I feel like it's always a good opportunity to, to educate. So someone asks, do humanists really have no religion? No, um, I, I call myself an atheist and a humanist and they're, they're two different things. And uh, I am just one person and a lot of other people have different explanations for what that means and but I do like to define my terms because it does mean different things to different people when I say atheist I'm talking very specifically about I don't believe in the god of the bible or any other man-made gods um, as far as the great mysteries of the universe I'm agnostic because how can I know you know what who, who started the universe how, what what came before the big bang I, I don't know you know so on those kind of questions I'm agnostic but to me, humanism describes where my values come from. 
to me, humanism is the positive process of using reason and learning and knowledge and empathy uh, to make the world a better place for more people. So that idea is not related to God necessarily at all. It's the notion that it's up to humans to make that change, a positive change in the world, or that humans have the power to do that, whether or not there's a God. Um, American Atheist, I mean, I'm sorry, um, American Humanist Association, their motto is literally good without a God. So they lead with the atheism, but I think they would agree that atheism for them describes what, they're, what they don't believe, but humanism describes what they do believe. And my understanding is that's why we were set up as humanistic Judaism and not as atheist Judaism. And there are many people in our movement who would never use the word atheist and don't even like it when I do. And I understand that, um, but uh, it's the humanism that we all have as a, as a commonality. And if you have not yet ever experienced humanistic Judaism in practice, I think you'll find that it's not about God at all. It doesn't mention God, but it's not anti-God. It's not anti-religion. It's simply about the human experience. And uh, so that, that's how I come at it with from. And um, so I would say, no, you don't have to be atheist to be a humanistic Jew by any stretch of, of the imagination. And, and that's, look, it's part of the complexity that Pew is trying to get at here is that a lot of this stuff is uh, overlapping and nebulous and not clearly defined. And they're giving Jews the opportunity to define it themselves. I saw some people complaining that there, is, that there even is this split between Jews by religion, Jews of no religion. I wanna be clear, I'm not complaining about that because I understand that if you didn't have it, if you only ask the question, what's your religion? Then you're gonna lose a million and a half Jews. And you may have lost me depending on how I answered that question. But by having this dichotomy, you get to include me and I am included. But what I'm saying is then don't ask only questions that make me look less than without also including a bunch of questions that are gonna show what my values are. So here's a question about Jews of color. Uh, someone mentioned that Pew says 8% of Jews are Jews of color, but there's other estimates floating um, between eight and 12%. So they were asking for any comments on that. Yeah, I don't have the chart right in front of me, but please go dig into it because it's very interesting. Basically Pew, there had been a, a um, controversy about this within the past year because some of the old school I don't know that it's relevant, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because I think it's relevant. White male um, Jews who have dominated Jewish demography for decades denied that um, Jews of color were anything more than like 8%. And, and they just came off really callous in the way that they did that. And Pew basically gave numbers for everybody to be happy because they said that overall, it was something like 92% of all Jews are white, white, non-Hispanic. Yet, when you look at it broken down by age cohort, as you get younger, Jews become more racially diverse. And if you look at it by households, 17% of all American Jews live in a multiracial household, which is exciting. But the way they get to that is, they include the non-Jews in those households because intermarriage is um, a diversifying factor in the American Jewish population. And as I pointed out, I think that's a good thing because I think diversity is a positive value. Um, not all Jews do, um, certainly when the diversity comes um, through intermarriage, but I think it's a positive and that's the universalist in me. And I think a lot of Jews agree, agree with me on that. And we're not really um, given voice in the organized Jewish community. So it's good news, I think overall, the Jews of color that I know have taken it as very good news. Um, it means we're diversifying and that's the message that they're now able to share. Um, and, and there is a moment now in the Jewish community around um, Jews of color and multiracial households where funders are putting some money into it now, finally. 
um, and, and leaders are being raised up. And it's something that we've actually, at our last board meeting, those of you who are on the SHA board know it's actually was, was um, the featured conversation at the last SHA board meeting, because I want uh, our movement to be more reflective of that racial diversity in the Jewish community as well. Um, how many questions uh, do you think we can take? Uh, Maybe another two or three if you have them. Yeah. Okay, great. So one question was where you saw commonalities between, you know, where was the biggest points of agreement or consistency among all of the subgroups, if any? Well, I, on some of the, the numbers I showed you, you know, 75% believe that anti-Semitism rose over the past five years. Um, I, I guess I'm one of those people. Um, I don't know how big a threat I, I think it is. I mean, um, I, I haven't experienced it personally that much, um, but I know it's real. Um, I don't think it's just perception. So that was certainly uh, a shared commonality. And, and look, you know, on that political stuff, Jews are overwhelmingly liberal. You know, they, they, they voted for Biden by 70%. That's a huge, huge gap um, between um, Democratic and, and Republican Jews. And um, I think that that gap is also about um, religiosity and religious privilege and support for uh, separation of church and state, which unfortunately many of our Orthodox cousins don't um, support in the ways that most Jews do. Um, I don't know whether they're being short-sighted about it or whether it's a longer term goal. But if the wall between church and state crumbles in America, we don't become an Orthodox Jewish country. <laughs> we become a Christian fundamentalist country. And then I don't know where that leaves our Orthodox cousins. Maybe they're still in a place of privilege, but I don't know. I, I, I would have, if I was them, I wouldn't want to take that chance. Um, I, Go ahead, Sarah, what, what were some of your other things? Because I see some interesting um, uh, comments as well, you know, like yeah. Buddhism. Oh. I just want to answer the, the Buddhism one that, that Marty threw in there. Um, Buddhism was one of the religions where if you answered Buddhism um, and then you said that you were Jewish um, as well, but you don't have a Jewish parent and you don't have a Jewish upbringing, you would not have been included in the Jewish community. Is it fair? I don't know. But if you said you were Buddhist and then you also said you have some attachment to being Jewish because one of your parents is or because you identify as it culturally, whatever, then you are in and you are one of the famous Jew boos. Um, so here's, I, uh, well, I just lost it, sorry. Sorry. Right. Here we go. What do Pew's findings imply for the makeup of Jewish community institutions? Who do these institutions represent and who is left out? I don't think there were big drops or big surprises. This has been an ongoing challenge now for several decades, if not a generation or more, which is that affiliation rates are low. And we struggle with that in humanistic Judaism as well, because we were modeled on the congregational denominational model. And that's in free fall outside of orthodoxy. And within orthodoxy, they're using a different model anyway. Um, this membership model, even the membership model at JCCs. So it's not really reflected in the Pew survey so much, but those of us who've been working on it understand that there are tweaks and then there are revolutions. And the tweaks to the membership model, um, that's been happening in, in some of our communities, those of you who are here from Kol Hadash in Chicago, they, you know, um, in the Birmingham temple, tweaked their membership models to allow more people to be able to belong, to, to not have to climb such high membership cost barriers and so on. Um, but then there are revolutions, you know, Chabad, and I didn't include it, but the Pew survey does look at participation in Chabad. Those of you who may not know, Chabad is an uh, Orthodox outreach arm of, of, of orthodoxy, they themselves are what you might call ultra-orthodox, but the people they serve are not, and they are 
um, certainly on the surface, very inclusive of any expression of, of Jewish identity, but they're promoting an orthodox version of Judaism. And a lot of Jews have participated in their programming but they completely overturned the model. They're not a membership organization. They don't charge for high holiday tickets. Uh, they, they've really overturned the model on so many things and they've been able to reach a lot of Jews doing it, but it depends how you measure their success because clearly they haven't turned a lot of us Orthodox. So I don't know how, you know, I, I do know how they measure their success in some ways, you know, but I don't know, um, how they feel about it. You know, they, they get a lot of Jews to do Jewish ritual uh, uh, practice. Like for example, uh, Sukkot, they, they go out, certainly here in New York City, I don't know where you, where you folks are, but if, if you're in any sizable Jewish community, you'll see Chabad out and about before the Jewish holidays trying to get you to shake the lulav and etrog. And, you know, for them, it's like the holy spark. You've released magic into the air and that, that was the job, you know, that's all they were hoping to do. Um, so if that's how they measure their success, that's great. You know, to me, I, I take inspiration from that, not the magic part, but the part about if I can excite one person about humanistic Judaism, even if they don't become a member, if they become aware that this is a way of identifying, I, that's that's my job, you know, then I did my job. And I've had the experience many, many times since I came on of telling someone what I do and then having them say, oh, that's how I believe. And I'm glad that there's a word for it. You know, they, they hadn't heard of humanism before. And now that they have, they know that there's a word for how they feel and they're happy about that. That's my little magical spark that I like to put out into the universe. All right, um, before I close out with the last question, I, uh, as the program coordinator, producer of Sector Democracy would be remiss if I did not invite all of you to sign up to volunteer for Jews for Secular Democracy. Um, so I'm gonna throw in the chat in just a second here after I ask the last question, a place to sign up, um, especially if you are someone in Florida, Illinois, Michigan, or New York, we have active cohorts there, uh, but you can start a new cohort in your state uh, to advocate for separation of church and state. So I'll throw that in there. Um, and end with this last question, uh, which I'm going to add on a little bit of a spin to. So the question is, you know, what what is the goal and purpose of a survey like this? Is it to make you know us happy as a Jewish community? Is it curiosity, awareness, fundraising? So what I'll add to that, Paul, is you know whatever Pew's motivations are, or the funders. How can we as a community um, use this survey to advance our own goals? Yeah. Well, obviously. It has given me an opportunity to talk about humanistic Judaism in a couple of op-eds I submitted um, to do this program and to raise awareness among the wider Jewish community that most Jews don't believe in the God of the Bible. What does that do? You know, who is leading us and how reflective are they of most Jews? Should they be? Um, I think that maybe for some Jews, they, want their leaders to believe it, even if they themselves don't believe it. I prefer to have leaders that I agree with as far as beliefs and values go. But some Jews, you know, and I, I've seen this happen. There was a famous case, uh, Rabbi David Wolpe in, in Los Angeles is a very well-known conservative rabbi. One year, let it slip out that Exodus was probably a myth. And his, his uh, congregants were up in arms and he walked it back. He took it back. And I, I just felt like, you know, I, I want to be able to talk about these things openly. And, and certainly the, the data that I shared tonight was what I selected out of it, because this is what I want to have the conversation about. But if we were an anti-poverty group, I would have shown a very different presentation tonight because there was a lot of data about um, how COVID hit the Jewish community financially and how many Jews live in poverty and who they are and what their age range is. And as we dig deeper into um, the data set, which they will release and other people will study it, um, where those Jews in poverty live. You know, so if you are a Jewish poverty organization, the data in this is, is going to be invaluable for you to to find out where the people are that you need to be serving, to share with your funders about what the needs are and so on. Um, and likewise, for any other of the issues or causes, 
that are happening in the Jewish community. In, in many cases, uh, there are enough questions in here for almost all of the Jew, Jewish communal organizations to pull something out and say, oh, this, is, this justifies the need that our mission is seeking to serve. And I certainly feel like it does that both for um, Society for Humanistic Judaism and our initiative, Jews for a Secular Democracy. Um, but it's that spin that I certainly um, feel very troubled by. And, you know, I spent uh, 16 years for an organization that kept pointing out the anti intermarriage spin. Now, there's hardly any anti intermarriage spin in this study, but it's all anti. Um, Jews of no religion, and it's the same people. You know, I show you the, the incredible overlap. So um, there's still a lot of work to be done about how the Jewish community can express multiple identities equally and, and share that fairly, um, as opposed to trying to speak with one voice. We were never one voice. We, we never spoke with one voice. I always find that to be problematic to try for our community to try to speak with one voice. If anything, what we can talk about is what I started with, which is pluralism. We've got a lot of different ideas among us. Um, you know, and the question before about what, what, what do we have in common? You know, I don't know that there is one universal thing we have in common, but we have a lot of overlapping circles of our Venn diagram. And I think that this idea of Jewish pluralism is kind of where to hang our collective hats as far as, um, what can we say that we all do? You know, there are, I've heard people say, well, the one thing all Jews can agree on is, is God, Torah, and Israel. I'm like, we can't agree on any of, the, any of those three. So um, I, I think it's about identification and uh, kind of a collective understanding. And I think this study overall does a good job at, at trying to get at that. Um, and so the things I'm pointing out is hopefully to let people understand where we can improve from here. And I wanna kind of release our staff people who are here and thank you all for participating.